The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Happy Monday, all. Uh, thank you for joining our webinar this morning. My name is uh, Drew Brackbill, and I'm on the SMRP team, and I'll be uh, moderating our webinar this morning and introducing our speakers for you all. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to just let everybody know that we won't be doing any live Q&A this morning, but if you have any questions for one of our presenters, you can send them to us after the webinar and we'll have a slide at the end with some contact info for you to direct any questions. So with that said, I'd like to now introduce our OSHA presenter this morning, Dr. Jonathan Baer. Uh, Dr. Baer is a health scientist in the Office of Chemical Hazards, Nonmetals at the U.S. Department of Labor's Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA. Uh, he is a subject matter expert for the agency's response to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, and he holds a PhD in toxicology. So thank you for being with us this morning, Dr. Baer, and uh, without further ado, I think we'll, we'll make you the presenter so you can share your screen with us. And uh, Jess, if you could go ahead and, and give Dr. Baer the, uh, the presenter seat. Um, I think we'll be good to go whenever you're ready, Dr. Bear. All right. So you should be able to see the screen. Um, I can see it. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much, Drew, for uh, the warm welcome. And I, I appreciate SMRP and all of our attendees today uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, OSHA our response to COVID-19, and, and more importantly, I think, to share an overview of OSHA's guidance materials on this topic with everyone here. I think, you know, at first, I want to ensure that we're all on the same page on what the hazard is and comprehend the context in which OSHA's, as well as your own response, exists. And that's to discuss what this, you know, virus is. So, uh, SARS, CoV-2 is a virus that causes this deadly disease, COVID-19. Uh, you have typical COVID-19 symptoms. They are being updated over at CDC, so it's always good to check CDC as well as OSHA's website to figure out what the symptoms are of the disease. Uh, it is a interesting virus because, you know, it's, it's typically described as causing fever, cough, shortness of breath but not everyone presents those symptoms. You know, for instance, there's a study that came out of New York City at a hospital there with people who were reporting for uh, care who had COVID-19, and only about 30% of those individuals had a fever. So it's one of those uh, diseases where, you know, a more general wellness check might be helpful. Anyway, as I mentioned, CDC keeps the current list of these symptoms. Uh, it's important to note that when you are thinking about how to assess this hazard and when you're devising approaches to mitigating this hazard that you think about it in a sort of community-driven way. Um, when we think about this disease, you know, it changes over time where we have epidemics where, where uh, the, the transmission is expanding in terms of frequency and where it's contracting, it changes over time, you know, and Originally, we're looking at the Northwest in New York City, transition now to the South, many areas of the South. Uh, and now we're looking at potentially Midwest and Mid-Atlantic as getting a little bit of a, more of a hit now. If you look within your own state, you're going to see differences between different counties and perhaps met metropolitan regions. And so it's always important to consider the local conditions uh, of your workplace. And you may have several different workplaces that span several different communities that have varying transmission risk. So it's always good to understand that, to have ongoing conversations with uh, your local health department and other health officials where your workplaces are located and keep abreast of uh, OSHA policies, CDC guidance, uh, the White House, and um, as we try to uh, ensure that workplaces are safe and that we can continue working. Now, I think you know, after saying all that, we can sort of recognize that this is a hazard and that we are all, you know, what, what we're facing as we try to make workplaces safe. And what OSHA has done, and I'd like to emphasize this, uh, you know, our, our mission in the midst of this pandemic 
is to assure safe and helpful working conditions for working men and women. And during this public health emergency, OSHA has fulfilled that mission by enforcing existing standards and providing training, outreach, education, and assistance. Uh, what you are seeing on this site and everything that we have done to date, we have not added any new requirements. This is all based on existing standards and enforcement of those standards. Now, what the, you're looking at on this site, um, the address may be a little bit difficult to remember. Another way to find it would be uh, osha.gov backslash coronavirus, and it will land you on this page. It may be whatever browser you're using. If you just type in OSHA COVID-19, I imagine this would also pop up. And, and what this page is, it's really a portal for information, occupational information for people to use. You know, the CDC is a great website. It's very comprehensive, uh, but it's important to know that OSHA has a narrow focus in terms of protect, protecting occupational health and safety. And CDC's guidance will often be a bit more expanded beyond that and to be considered, to, it will consider a wider range. So um, what we see here very much complements what the CDC is producing. And what you'll find on this page is a whole lot of information. Um, the guidance documents are based on traditional infection prevention and industrial hygiene practices. Uh, they provide recommendations to employers that are structured around a risk pyramid uh, to assess the hazards in your workplace. And so when you think of a risk pyramid, the way that, it's, the way that we've presented it, and you'll find that in uh, the document guidance on preparing workplaces for COVID-19 that I'm sort of waving the, the hand over. Um, it's broken down into four different groups, very high and high, which you probably will not have any workers who are doing activities that are very high or high. A very high risk uh, activity would be primarily found in a healthcare facility doing a, um, procedure that would result in the aerosolation of um, respiratory droplets. Um, and uh, a high risk situation would be a healthcare facility dealing with people who may or may not have COVID-19. Uh, yeah. That those two uh, different categories probably won't be reflected in what your employees will be doing. Um, so you're gonna see more moderate and low risk. And this is, uh, for moderate, it would be individuals who frequently interact with uh, other coworkers and members of the public that may be getting in those breathing zone areas. As, as um, you probably know, this virus is transmitted primarily, as we understand it, uh, through large droplets, the viral particles in large droplets. And so that's generally why uh, the, call for physical distancing is in place, the six foot range. Uh, typically under normal conditions, large droplets that are breathed out or are emitted through yelling or sneezing or coughing, uh, those will deposit within six feet. So um, that's usually what we're considering uh, there. But uh, so when you are working with other coworkers for, uh, commonly during the day or you're interacting with members of the public, uh, that, that's considered more of a risk. Low risk would be something where your interaction with other people really isn't that great or you know, you're effectively, um, your work activities just don't involve other, other coworkers and um, members of the public. And then of course, you would, have no, you would have no occupational risk if you can perform anything remotely which uh, there may be a few operations, maybe uh, administrative operations uh, that may be able to be performed in your workplaces that may be able to be remote. But um, so this page has a lot of different types of information. It uh, has the risk pyramid, which I just mentioned. It has general and industry specific information. Uh, if we scroll down here, this is where we have a lot of our updates. It's often important to take a look at this page, this section, just to make sure you're, you're up to date. Um, as we scroll down under the control and prevention box, we see a lot of specific categories that provide specific um, 
guidance. And what you're going to see is like when you go through these documents, there, there's a there's a general framework that all these documents sort of hold. And that is the importance of um, a risk assessment to determine what your hazards are and what risks those hazards pose, and then have it ref then mitigate those hazards through controls. And those controls can take a wide range of um, different uh, approaches. And so, you know, you can do the, the basic one, which is elimination, which if you can find any job activities or, or um, work activities that you can make remote, that effectively will remove the individual from any sort of exposure situation if they are indeed working from home. Uh, you can apply different uh, controls such as um, you can engineer things where you are installing uh, partitions or screens that are um, impervious to uh, respiratory droplets and that can effectively protect individuals. You can arrange your workspaces so that you can ensure that physical distancing. Um, there are other approaches where, you know, perhaps you may have uh, people bunch up, like when you're clocking in or clocking out during breaks or during uh, lunch or dinner breaks. And so you can stagger those instead of having everyone arrive at work around 8 a.m. You can stagger those every 15, 20 minutes to ensure that people are coming in at different times. That way you don't have bunching up. Uh, you have to consider sometimes you're going to have inclement weather and that can also cause people to rush to entrances. So you want to try to think about where there may be um, areas within your workplace where uh, there could be bunching up of individuals. You could, uh, in break rooms, it might be important to consider not just having that one break room, but also include other areas like training rooms or conference rooms to expand where the workers can be and lower their density in those spaces. Um, you can think about if possible, adding additional shifts. And maybe some places don't have night shifts. So it, it, that could be an opportunity to, uh, you know, reduce transmission risk. Um, then you have uh, other sorts of controls. Um, there's a lot of talk about PPE and uh, facial coverings. It's good to remember that facial coverings are not considered PPE. Uh, the, the primary reason to that is that um, when we think about facial coverings, it's important to recognize that they are technically not designed for a specific standard, and so they aren't made or tested for a standard. And so the effectiveness of them can vary quite a bit. Uh, you know, in general, face coverings are always going to be at least two ply, two, two uh, layers, and they will be covering the nose and mouth. But beyond that, there's a wide variation on materials and styles that can greatly impact um, the effectiveness of that. It's always good to, you know, take a look at CDC's guidance on those products, um, on facial coverings. It's also important to realize that when you are implementing things like a facial covering, you may be involved in work where there may, could be issues with the facial covering being saturated with solvents such as you know acetone or something like that and that may present a hazard on its own and so in cases where um, it may be not feasible to wear a facial covering uh, consideration should be given towards using something like a face shield which would you know apply that uh, barrier that would uh, help prevent those respiratory droplets from traveling uh, I want to scroll back up and so you can see there's a number of different things here that could be helpful. Medical information, the, the industry-specific control and prevention guidance documents. I think one thing that may be very interesting to folks here, and um, unfortunately I will not be able to be here for the Q&A, but what I will be showing you here is uh, one part of the site that gets updated very frequently, which is the frequently asked questions part. And it's always good to be giving talks and interacting with groups like SMRP because this gives us a really good indication of, you know, voids that are out there and the guidance that's being issued and, and certain needs that um, stakeholders have for us to provide greater um, clarity 
and it to express what exactly compliance is. And so what you're going to see under the frequently asked questions is a number of different topics and uh, they can provide information that may be specific to, to your needs. And so uh, there's a whole section on you know, cloth face coverings, how exactly they're different between surgical masks and uh, respirators, um, different requirements, and what exactly, um, you know, what is guidance per se and what is a requirement. Um, you know, OSHA doesn't require um, businesses to use cloth face coverings, though it is important to recognize that uh, we do uh, have our general duty clause, section 5A1, where employers are um, required to keep their workplaces safe and healthy. And so you may find for your own hazard assessment that cloth face coverings are um, should be worn. And so this gives you a, a, a bit of information about that. And you can just go through and see there's a lot of different uh, topics and questions that you may have that might help clarify uh, how to comply uh, in the midst of this rather dynamic situation. And so I'm going to um, head back to the main page. And again, you know, it's, it's very important to look at this site regularly. If this is a dynamic situation. We are constantly uh, updating the site, providing more guidance. Again, we are not issuing, we, ha we have not issued um, any new requirements. This is all existing, based on existing requirements. Uh, we do have a collection of um, inf memos, uh, enforcement guidance and interpretation. So uh, things such as, uh, you know, periodic training or, um, fit testing, things like that, as long as there's good faith and attempt to, to comply with those uh, provisions, we reckon, you know, their, their, their discretion will be put into play, you know, enforcement discretion will be given. Uh, the idea being that we recognize that many of these uh, services, such as fit testing, due to the pandemic, uh, may not be offered. But it's just good to have good faith in trying to get those done and, you know, enforcement discretion will be will be provided in those situations. And so I think this is a pretty general uh, overview of the site. I guess one thing I'd want to show is uh, this one uh, document, which might be fairly helpful to you all, which is guidance on returning to work. And I just wanted to step through this real quickly. And this is one of the the main guidance documents that may be helpful. You know. At, Again, you know, what we're trying to provide here is a flexible framework for you to implement um, your approach to mitigating this hazard, and that's to devise your uh, hazard assessment based on the conditions that are specific to your location and your needs and finding ways to mitigate that hazard. And what this document does, it does give you that very general framework. And it goes through all the different, um, you know, it, it's this document exists within a suite of other documents, such as the uh, Department of Health and Human Services guidance on preparing workplace, as well as the White House's guidance for opening up America. Again, uh, you may be more familiar with the terminology, you know, the phased in approach as, uh, you know, the situation, you know, depending upon how controlled the situation is in our communities. Um, and this is the discussion on the phases. And there, it's the, the framework is very much based on these certain guiding principles, such as a hazard assessment, um, using certain types of hygiene, if, emphasizing hygiene. You know, a lot of these um, hygiene measures that may seem somewhat in, uh, funny to some, but a lot of these hygiene measures are, at least their they're importance um, they may be new behaviors, especially in terms of the frequency of how often you get your hands cleaned or, or when you need to do that or when you're using hand sanitizer. And so when you're doing things like that, it's good to emphasize and, you know, include that in training and emphasize the importance of it and to provide reminders. And that may be take the form of signs or, or other measures 
um, you know, toolbox talks, things like that to encourage that. Social distancing, uh, it's very, you know, that's one of the major uh, core elements of these approaches, this the guidance for an approach. And again, a lot of times, you know, not only do your employees need to be trained, but it also has to be um, encouraged and reinstilled. I think often, you know, again, these are new behaviors and, and people tend to forget sometimes. And so it's good to really reinforce that. Um, it discusses uh, identification of sick employees, screening them, uh, when returning to work is appropriate. It goes through a, a, a number of examples of controls. And it's important to recognize like when you see the controls mentioned in here, these are not requirements. These are examples of approaches that we think are feasible. And so just because it's written here doesn't mean you have to do it, but it's giving you examples of what could be done. And we're gonna scroll a little further. And so, you know, just looking at workplace flexibility, training is very important. A lot of these behaviors, a lot of the um, things like facial coverings, these things, how to like put on and take off these things are very important to train on. They're often very new to people. Uh, not everything may be intuitive, so it's important to have a very effective uh, training program. Anti-retaliation, uh, you know, that your workers do have rights, but I think what's very important is that, you know, your workers are effectively your front line to identify and address hazards in the workplace. And so I think it's good to the best of your ability to provide your workers with some level of ownership so that they feel comfortable in expressing their concerns and that those concerns can be evaluated to see if there are um, steps for mitigation that need to be taken. Uh, so the document, of course, you know, everything, as I mentioned, is based on existing standards. Um, there is a subset of frequently asked questions available in this document, but it, you're going to have a much larger selection of questions on the website. So we'll go through a number of these. And just goes through different programs that are available and how to contact us and so I'm just going to head back over to the main site and, I, and one thing that's important to note I think is please check the site out as often as you can we're, we're on um, Twitter and uh, you know there, there's many different ways in which you can communicate with us uh, we're on Twitter at at OSHA underscore DOL um, we have a bi-weekly newsletter called Quick Takes where we often will highlight new guidance and other new materials that we're producing. Uh, if we go over to the home page, um, there's a nifty little um, thing you can subscribe for right down here, COVID-19 tip of the day. And it's not going to be comprehensive I, and maybe over the course of 300 days will be comprehensive, but what it provides are little tidbits and, and pieces of knowledge that are found in the rest of our guidance materials. And it just sort of reemphasizes and um, highlights certain things that are important. And so I think that's where I'd like to leave us at today. And it's just a reminder, please go to the site. Um, which you can get to OSHA.gov backslash coronavirus, you're going to find a lot of things that are, are a lot of information that's very important to what you're doing when you're devising your approach to respond to this hazard. Uh, that law of guidance material, law of information that can be incorporated into your assessment and your determination for what type of controls um, work for your workplace. And at that, I'd like to thank everyone and hand it back over to Drill. Thank you, Dr. Baird. Yeah, we, we really appreciate your, your expert perspective on this topic. I think that was a, an interesting look at what OSHA has done to respond to COVID-19 and, and a great primer on the issue of COVID as a workplace hazard for our members. So, uh, Jess, if you could, uh, oh, there we go. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, I, I wanted to say now we're, we're going to move to a discussion between two SMRP subject matter experts on COVID-19 best practices and specific ways they've seen an impact from the pandemic in recent months. Uh, our two SMRP experts are Doc Palmer of Richard Palmer and Associates 
and Kevin Clark of Fluke. Uh, Doc Palmer is a managing partner of Richard Palmer and Associates, and he has over three decades of industrial experience, primarily as a practitioner within the maintenance department of the Jacksonville Electric Authority. Uh, from 1990 through 1994, Palmer was responsible for overhauling the existing maintenance planning organization, and the resulting success uh, played a role in expanding planning to all crafts and stations owned and operated by the utility. So. Uh, McGraw-Hill subsequently sought out Doc Palmer to author the Maintenance Planning and Scheduling Handbook, which was first published in 1999 and is now in its fourth edition. Doc Palmer also directed the purchase and implementation of a CMMS and administered the Preventive Maintenance Program. Additionally, he's delivered numerous well-received maintenance articles and presentations for the industry, and he currently provides guidance, mentoring, and training for companies internationally for maintenance planning success. Uh, Doc Palmer is a registered professional engineer with a master's degree in business administration, and he is also a CMRP, uh, Certified Maintenance and Reliability Professional. Kevin Clark has been a fluke leader since 2016, and he has more than 25 years of experience in operations leadership, focusing on engineering, asset management, IT, supply, manufacturing automation, and safety systems. Kevin previously held leadership and engineering positions at Proficient, Caterpillar and Johnson & Johnson, and he is a long-standing long member of SMRP and has been a CMRP since 2004. So now I believe Doc and Kevin are both going to talk briefly about their respective experience work and broad perspectives on the COVID issue for about five minutes each, and then we'll move to a more kind of free-flowing discussion. So Kevin, would you like to go first? Yeah, thanks, Drew. Um, first, I wanted to thank Dr. Bear for his presentation. That's uh, quite a, a sight for an ever-changing situation. And I, I think I think the way I, I kind of want to start this, uh, and just for those of you who know me, five minutes is nowhere near enough for me to get past the first sentence or two. Um, so I'll do my best. Um, so those of you that are OEMs, uh, out in the audience, um, you'll understand this, and you practitioners, I think you'll you'll understand it too. But you know, normally when our industry is changing, and we're seeing some trends in that inside of the industry, we start to we start to make change to our products and and address the needs of those changes in industry. Um, when it came to COVID, uh, we had to no, look uh, no further than ourselves um, to understand the needs of everybody, not just a particular industry, but everybody and the things that we really needed to, to go after and begin to create to address the needs in the industry. It's one of the reasons we created CleanMate, uh, basically a, a CMS that specifically addresses the needs of keeping our employees safe and clean. And so, um, you know, this, this time it was just that dramatically different where um, we didn't need to go out and do a whole bunch of VOC and, and to understand what those needs were. Um, so, you know, we were going through what we call Industry 4.0. It's our fourth industrial revolution, and, and so digital transformation was a big part of that. And so everybody was working at their own pace. You know, you had some companies that were just so far ahead of everybody else, and you had other companies that were just starting to look at digital transformation and how that's affecting us in the business, um, not only from a personal standpoint, but for our technology. And then we had this disruptor come in called COVID, and all of a sudden, all strategic plans were in question on how we're, how we're deploying uh, and our technology and how we're uh, digitally transforming. And so when you look at, look at what we were doing, um, there's some challenges in what we were doing. And so when, when, we, when we think about this and we start bringing technologies in, people um, are a big part of that. And so, you know, as, as technology comes in, people get a little anxious about jobs going out. And so some of the, some of the work that's that needs to be done is helping people to understand that it's that it's a support mechanism for the people and it's an enabler to make our jobs better and more efficient. And so when we when we look at these tough topics like bringing in new technology, we need to be very smart and very wise about how we educate our clients um, and our employees on the technology that's coming in and how it makes 
things better for all employees, not, not just uh, uh, finding ways to reduce headcount. The other one that we all go through when we're, when we're working on our reliability programs is, is change. Um, so how we embrace that fear um, causes a lot of anxiety. Um, and just, just to kind of support this, you know, over the last couple of decades, we saw training um, within the private sector drop off uh, by 30%. And, but at the same time, as digital transformation is coming in, we're seeing deficiencies in our in our uh, our employees across the board in digital. So digital's going up, but training's gone down, and so we've we've got some disparity there. Um, and when you look at you look at the ages of our our technicians out there, um, 95 plus percent of them are over 30 years old. Um, and so whether they're technology enabled, technology inclined may be a question. And so there's, there's some things we gotta take care of from a training standpoint, just to, uh, to take care of the fear of change and lifting up the skill sets within our organizations. It, you know, and the other thing that we, we can't ignore is, is uh, the value of the system that we're bringing in, right? So um, when we bring these systems in, uh, they have to line up to what our strategy says. And of course, everybody's strategies were turned upside down. So strategy is so much more important over the next six months to relook at what we were doing in the past or not doing and move that into the future. And I think another interesting point about when, when you start looking at employees and, and retaining employees, um, a st statistic I used for uh, couple of years now is is that ages 22 to 60 they're looking for digitally enabled organization and so what that means is is for those that are leading in digital um, they're being looked at closer by that age group which is a very important age group for us in industry um, they're looking closer at those digitally enabled organizations than they are for not so digitally enabled. So, um, you know, to address the uh, the newer needs like working virtual, uh, remote asset condition monitoring, and and things that that our industry are now looking much closer at because we're looking for ways to allow our people to to um, adhere to social distancing. Um, those technologies have quickly become a priority in business. Then the ecosystem that you're working with. Um, so it's not just a matter of you know going out and buying a whole bunch of technology, bringing it in, and and voila, you have um, a very efficient system. We still need to understand the ecosystem that we're working within, because that ecosystem matters for scalability. As we want to grow in the future, as we want to add new things to that ecosystem. We need to be very cognizant of that. So it's important you look closely at, at, your, at your suppliers and compare that closely to the, the needs in your business. And I think the last thing I really wanna talk about um, before we hand this over to Doc is just the fact of being able to live agile, being able to live not only personally, but in our work. And COVID, this did us a favor here that it really advanced the ability to see how agile we could be. We were forced to be agile. So when you look at digital transformation, a lot of times you think it's a, it's a, it's a technology thing. I'm here to tell you, it's not a technology commitment. It is a human capital and organizational commitment. It's doing things differently. It's, it's doing things so that you can be flexible, so your organization can be flexible and, and we can adjust. As we see new things like this come up, we're able to adjust and our businesses aren't devastated in a way that, that uh, in many cases, companies go under, people are unemployed. And so I, I think, I, think that, I guess my biggest message here is that, um, we were all involved in the industrial industrial 4.0. We were all involved in the digital transformation. COVID can look like a black eye to it, 
but in reality, it's an acceleration of what we were already doing. So with that, I'll hand that back over to Andrew. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Uh, and I guess uh, now I, I, I'd say, Doc, uh, do you have sort of some, some similar uh, top level thoughts for us uh, that you could share before we move into our kind of discussion section? I sure do. Thank, thanks, Drew. Um, I love talking to each other in our maintenance family. And our walk through this COVID thing is really going to be critical. There, there's a big tendency to not do maintenance when times are hard like this. And I jokingly tell a lot of people, any just in good times, um, hey, you can save a lot of money if you want to cut out maintenance for two years. And then the manager saves money and gets promoted to another company. And then your plant does falls apart. And what happens is we have a great tendency to not do the little things that keep things from breaking. And you can only put off changing the oil in your car for so long. And what you end up with is, is even more reactive maintenance than normal. And we can do the reactive maintenance and get a pat on the back. But reactive maintenance is not safe. It's not nearly as safe as proactive maintenance. If you know from you've done the vibration route, you've used the technology you've connected that um, Kevin's been talking about, you know that a bearing has a problem, but nobody else even knows about it. And you can schedule yourself time to go do it during the day when it's not raining, when you can take your time, you can put on your equipment, you can socially distance, and you can take care of the bearing. Um, if you don't do that and the bearing breaks in the middle of the night, no one knows exactly what the problem is. You send a bunch of people out there in a rainy, wet, dark condition, and you get the thing fixed and you get a pat on the back, but definitely not safe. So, um, one thing that, that really perks my ear up uh, is when um, Dr. Bear said the word flexibility. I saw that on one of the slides. And Kevin said the word agile. I, I want to share a secret with you. And the secret is that no one is perfect. And that's what Dr. Deming said back in 1950s. And that's what maintenance planning is all about. Um, Dr. Deming went to American companies and said, if you'd admit you're not perfect, you could get better because you're always looking for little ways to correct your imperfectness. And Americans laughed at Dr. Deming and so he left America and went to Japan and helped them create a big quality movement that came back to the United States 30 years later in the 1980s. But we've never really incorporated that in maintenance very well. And in times of uncertainty, which is, all the time because you're never perfect. That, that's really what maintenance planners are. You, you have an issue with a piece of equipment, an asset, and a planner puts together a job plan so we can go work on it. Um, and it's not perfect. And the crafts people go out there and do the best job they can. And we want them to suggest ideas for the next time we work on it, how we could be better. Well, if you would do it in this order, it would be safer. You could socially distance better. You really only need one person to work on it because this, 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 and that, if you bring this special tool. And then the planner becomes a craft historian and we get better over time. And that's the, the dimming cycle, which is the real success of maintenance planning. And then on the scheduling side, we just don't do as much work as we could. And what really helps in scheduling is if a scheduler every week just gives us a list of work that we could do. And the list has to be big enough. And I found out when you fully load a crew, when you say, hey, in a perfect world, you could do all these jobs, but it's okay if you don't get them done, all done. We end up being a little bit more productive and that's just the power of a list. And that's essentially Parkinson's law, which is 
the amount of work assigned expands to fill the amount of time available. So in this COVID crisis, the people that we have, if you have so many people, whatever shifts you're working on, however you think you have to socially distance and spend extra time putting on extra safety equipment, we need to give people enough work to get all the work that they could get done under those conditions and then accept it's okay we don't get it all done. Um, typically, productivity, I say if you had 30 craftspeople, you could get the work of 45 done. You get a 50% bump. But I think with the COVID thing, it knocked, the 30 people might only be performing at the level of 20 because we have the extra safety and hygiene. But with a 50% bump, you could get back up to 30 people. So it, it's a big deal for us. Um, we want to be productive and we don't want to relax back into not doing the proactive work and hoping nothing breaks. Because eventually, and not too far ahead of time, things are gonna break. So my take on the, the dimming thing is the flexibility, collect information uh, from your crafts on how we could do the job safer in spite of the crisis uh, and being safe with the crisis. And, and I do wanna share one story, um, a utility I worked with in the Western United States, they did the full scheduling in May in the height of their COVID restrictions. They completed more worker orders than they had ever completed in a single month in the history of their utility. And I think a lot of it was going where they always assigned two people to some things. They started assigning one person to something and say, take your time, be safe, don't rush. There's only one of you there. And overall, they completed more work doing that. And I now I think I've talked with that utility lately and they're, they're getting relaxed a little bit. They're going back to assigning two people to things and their productivity has dropped. And I think we need to be ever vigilant about that and protect our productivity and make sure we're being safe as well as giving ourselves enough work to do and not just sitting back and blaming it on the crisis that we can't do as much. So. Drew, I think you had, um, you were gonna kind of lead me and Kevin and some thoughts maybe that we could interact and share with you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Doc. And uh, I think I had kind of prepared some, some broad strokes questions uh, in advance. I, I guess I wanted to start by asking kind of maybe a broad question and, and I'll, I'll toss this one to you, Kevin, first for your thoughts. Uh, what do you think that the future holds for maintenance and reliability professionals in light of COVID-19? I realize it's a very broad question, but kind of what is the, the one year down the road, maybe out to five years down the road, what does that look like for SMRP members? Um, so I, the one year, I, I think, uh, uh, let's be fair, uh, survival. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I think, uh, Organizations are looking closely at their strategies, are looking closely at the assets they have, the personnel they have, and trying to figure out the best path forward. I, I think I think at first six to 12 months is, is going to be an awful lot of that. We have seen a significant uptick in technology um, in the way of um, looking at what can I do different? What, what can I go do today that that helps us be more, and I'll use the word again, agile, efficient. Um, I did wanna add one more thing that, that Doc brought up that I thought was a really good point. We've also seen significant increase in attention to detail of things like the assets, things like the procedures involved in um, maintaining assets. So I, th I think, I think what what you're going to see is is more focus on um, taking care of what we have, and then utilizing not only um, up up uh, upskilling our technology uh, or our technicians, but deploying technology to help us be better, faster, more agile. Great, yeah, uh, Doc. What do you think? Yeah, I think there's a place 
for the SMRP. Uh, and it's a shame we have to wait on a crisis to get really good at our game. Um, but that's exactly the purpose of SMRP is to share information that don't reinvent the wheel. Um, I mean, there's people been in the SMRP for, you know, 20 and 30 years. Um, and, and the conference this fall is, is going to be virtual. Um, don't use that as an excuse, people, not to tune into the conference. There's going to be a lot of, it, they're going to be live presentations, but they're going to be online. And this is the time to share uh, and ask questions, um, you know, there, there are lots of new ways to do things that we haven't thought of because we haven't had to think of them. And there's probably a thousand great answers that are slightly different from each other. And this that's the purpose of this professional organization is to bring us together. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah. I guess secondarily, I wanna just sort of ask the question of, of you both, what are some current COVID-19 related best practices that you've seen uh, in the kind of businesses you've been exposed to uh, over the past couple months uh, that you think may end up becoming kind of the new normal? Uh, Kevin, if you wanted to go for that one first. I kind of wanted to hear Doc answer this one first, but I'll take it. <laughs> um, so it's, uh, it's, a, it's a difficult question because we don't know what the new normal is going to look like. Um, and we don't even know if we've seen the new normal yet. Um, but I can I can tell you some of the some of the change that we've seen. It, it's a slightly what I answered before, and we've seen that attention to detail, where um, organizations not willingly, but have almost been forced to step back a bit and take a look at their processes. Um, when when you had to skinny the organization down, you had to social distance the organization, you had to find new ways of doing the same level of production you were doing before, um, it forced organizations to be much better at what they do. Um, and I, I think, I think if, if I was to say um, what might be the new norm, it's exactly that. It's taking taking a closer look at what we do each and every day and doing a better job of researching what tools are available to us. Um, we had a luxury before that as long as we're efficient, as long as we're profitable, as long as you know we, we keep our investors happy, then we don't really need to get any better. And I think COVID proved all of that wrong that we need to have that flexibility, that capability to adjust on the fly um, if necessary. Um, we don't know what the next thing is that, that, might, that might slow us down. And maybe COVID is going to give us problems for quite some time. We just, we just don't even know that. So it's hard to define exactly what the new normal is, but I think the big thing that's changing out there in the industry is that they're looking much closer, much deeper at what they do every day in those maintenance and reliability processes. Yeah, I think that's a really good insight. Doc, what do you think? What are, what are some things that you've seen that you think will become a part of the new the new normal? I think we're going to wash our hands a lot more. Um, I'll say that. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I think the Kevin stuff, you know, we're, we're going to use a lot more new technology, remote sensors and stuff, so we don't have to go and, and touch something and I think I'm 61. I'm over 50 years old. I love paper, but I, I'm dragging myself. And I've, I've seen a lot of good stuff with mobile um, technology where work orders get sent to somebody's cell phone and tablet and that kind of stuff. I think those things are, are going to come faster because of this. I think there's going to be a IT investment in the technology that if we're smart enough as maintenance professionals, we can glom onto our IT people and say, because of the crisis, we need this, which we've needed for a while. And that'll help make the case for those technologies. Um, some things I think we're doing now that are not going to stay. Uh, I mentioned, you know, you used to always assign two people to a job. And now a lot of places I've seen are 
they just one person go out and work on something because they're strapped for people. Mm -hmm. But I, I think they're going to drift back to two people, and I think that's a supervisor issue that's going to be that's always been a problem. I don't know if we're going to help that too much. I've seen a lot of plants go to two shifts where we used to have a day shift where everything's really convenient to get together and coordinate, but now they have two shifts that don't even see each other so that if one shift gets all infected, the other shift won't be infected. But um, I don't I don't think that's going to be the new norm, but I think that's going to be a we'll be better at transitioning to that quickly. Um, and uh, I mean, it's hard it's hard to say here. I think maybe just the basic hygiene facilities in our our plant will have you know better washing facilities. I work with a lot of pharmaceuticals and you you wash five or six times and put on special outfits. I think there will be more of that in regular plants, but but certainly not to that degree of a pharmaceutical. Hmm. Yeah. I, so, Doc, I had kind of another one for you that I think you you sort of already touched on this in, in that last response, but how has the pandemic affected maintenance and reliability planning specifically, and will these impacts persist, or do you think things eventually will go back to the way they were pre-COVID? I think the planning has, uh, the pandemic has, the first gut reaction is stop all preventive maintenance, stop all proactive maintenance and we'll just fix things when they break and we hope they won't break and and we maintenance professional know that that's not the right answer for more than about a month and so we really need to do a good job helping each other prepare cases that we can show to our managers even better than others i've had some facilities that the knee-jerk reaction is you know, we're short mechanics, so let's grab the planner and give the planner a box of tools and that will have one more mechanic. And you just cut your maintenance efficiency by 50% if you pull the planner and put the planner on a toolbox. So that's awful practice. So, so we need to be ready, ready for that. Um, we, we need to be really good at our game explaining things with little sound bites yeah, let's just put off changing the oil in our car for a couple of years, see what happens. And we, we just need those sound bites and elevator speeches where you can explain to your managers and the people that make the money decisions, because that's our job. And staff positions are real easy to cut. Planning, reliability professional, scheduling. You know, why do we need any of that? And we know the answer because we want to be a profitable plant that operates safely in the long run. And, and we're the key to that, but we've always had a hard case to make for that. Hmm. Yeah. I, I, Kevin, did you have any kind of thoughts on the, the planning process and how it will change or, or, you know, whether it will revert to a kind of pre COVID norm at some point? Um, you know, I would, I'll defer to um, Doc on this because, you know, Doc and I speak the same language. We just come from different perspectives. Mm -hmm. I come a little bit more on the, from a technology perspective, and he comes from that deep process knowledge uh, perspective. And, and <clears throat> without good process, technology will never work. Mm -hmm. And so you have to always keep that mindset. And, and that's why what Doc is talking about of breaking breaking good process um, just for the sake of the day um, won't work in technology any better. And so technology does allow us and enable us to do an awful lot of things, but processes adherently um, necessary in technology as it is in just standard process with a technician going out and, and following it line by line. So uh, I would, I would, defer to doc on that one because as long as i've got good maintenance process i can automate it but yeah, let, me, let me chime in there too right uh when i went to georgia tech they had this drown proofing class you had to take um 
And one of the parts of the test is on this Olympic sized pool. You had to jump in on one side, swim underwater all the way to the other side and swim all the way back while you're still underwater. And that's difficult if you're not a like a great swimmer and I'm not a great swimmer. And I jumped in as far as I could, you know, dive. And I got the other side, turned around, pushed off on the other end, and I got about a third of the way back. And my lungs were bursting. And instead of keeping with a smooth stroke, I started just scrabbling with my mm-hmm. arms. And everybody that did that, you could just see them in the water, slowing down. And it's lucky I didn't drown. I got to the other end and I got my point. But the process is key, and this is the critical time for process and for us to share information. And I just really appreciate Dr. Bear um, showing the OSHA website and all the information in it. Um, that, that was that was a good read for me, and I've got my homework assignment for the rest of the day is to be <laughs> reading through the website. So I appreciate your having me um, involved in this. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, uh, I think, you know, as, as we're, you know, we've got maybe time for one more kind of question. I, and then I think we'll wrap it up, but I, I wanted to ask you both kind of what are the most effective, in your opinion, COVID-19 kind of mitigation practices that you've seen or become aware of and, you know, how can SMRP practitioners potentially implement those in their, in their own workplaces? Um, and, you know, maybe just a, a, a quick uh, answer on that one. <laughs> we are kind of running out of time yeah. here. <laughs> uh, I'll jump in real quick, Doc. Uh, my my answer is fairly simple. It's how do we keep people remote? How do we how do we allow them to distance, right? And I I think that's that's the most difficult um, situation in a maintenance and reliability um, shop or at the work site is how do we allow them to be able to social distance? And, and you know, it's especially from my perspective, remote. Um, capabilities is going to help um, is going to help support that um, so I from my perspective is is find as many ways that you can be remote but the on-site to enable the the folks that are on-site to do their job and at the same time be able to distance yeah I like that the, the remote the technology and and be asking people crafts how do you think we could do this more remotely? Keep asking, because a lot of, you know, you got 30 mechanics, electricians, instrument techs, they've got a lot of great ideas. This is the time to ask. Any any of y'all think we can do any of this remote? Let me know, write it down, you know, and let's get better as we go along. Yeah. But, but just to end up, I guess, the main practice I'm seeing right now is using one person instead of two, where you can do it safely and go into two shifts that are isolated um, mm-hmm. and then just the general focus on the hygiene yeah well i i think i'd, I'd like to wrap it up here by showing a kind of a final slide uh if any of you have any questions uh for any of our presenters please go ahead and send them to me uh a brackbill at smrp.org We'll ensure that your questions are routed to the correct person, and we would ask that uh, you get us any questions or feedback you may have by this Friday so we can uh, get our, our questions through to the presenters in a timely fashion. And with that, I wanted to thank everybody uh, for attending our webinar. I wanted to thank Dr. Bear for his talk and, and Kevin and Doc for sharing your, your knowledge and expertise. Uh, and thanks again to everyone for attending, and we appreciate uh, you all coming out to talk about this very timely uh, issue and hope everybody has a good rest of your Monday. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah. Thank you. That will we'll call it a day. Thanks.